Pray with me. Lord, soften our hearts to hear your word and, res and respond in obedience to you. Through Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Jesus is king, and we, and we owe our allegiance to him. I suspect church sermons around the United States are beginning this way, and if not beginning, that they are ending this way today. And when we consider the Christians living around the world and in many different political structures, they realize that their earthly citizenship matters less than their eternal one. Christians assert that our king is King Jesus and our allegiance is to him. There, I've said it again. <laughs> When we lived in Turkey as Christian leaders from the U.S., we were citizens, still are citizens. We had to abide by the laws of the U.S. as well as the laws of the Turkish state. Now, despite the suspicion from Turkey that we expatriates would try to influence and weaken the loyalties of the Turkish citizens, we were only interested and persuading people to submit to Jesus as king. That's it. <laughs> now, in response to the disturbing events on January 6th, the next night, Thursday night, at least 40 of us, maybe more, joined together for the Great Litany, which is opportunities for prayer. And it's very thorough. We prayed for a lot of things. And it was so good to be together, even though it was virtually and through a screen. But we were praying together as a community. We were reminded, quote, from all blindness of heart, from pride, vanity, and hypocrisy, from envy, hatred, and malice, and from all lack of charity, good Lord, deliver us. And from all false doctrine, heresy, and schism, from hardness of heart and contempt of your word and commandments. Good Lord, deliver us. Now, the result of our prayers put us in the frame of mind to see the big picture. And meditating on scripture this week in preparation for this sermon also accomplished that for me. I began the week attracted to a familiar verse, deciding to read up and to think a little bit more deeply on its meaning, meaning for me personally, as well as for all of us. That verse is Isaiah 42, verse 3. A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. Now, I will come back to this, but firstly, I would be remiss if I do not make the connections between all of the scriptures before we go much further. See, the he that Isaiah refers to is the servant. That is the one who would be born Messiah. In other words, Jesus of Nazareth. In our Acts chapter 10, starting around verse 37, gives this summary of Jesus' ministry. John's message spread through Judea, beginning in Galilee, where he called people to be ritually cleansed through baptism. We know God had identified Jesus as the uniquely chosen one by pouring out his Holy Spirit on him and by empowering him. We also know that Jesus went through the land doing good for all and healing all who were suffering under the oppression of the evil one, for God was with him. Jesus was establishing justice. 
Finally, we know that Isaiah's prophecy and Jesus are linked because of the voice from God at Jesus' baptism. In Isaiah 42, God speaks, saying, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. Now, that's Isaiah. Let's listen to Mark tell the story about Jesus. Mark chapter 1. John talks about the one who is mightier than he and whose sandal strap he is not worthy to stoop down and untie. He says, I've washed you here through baptism with water, but he, when he gets here, he will wash you in the Spirit of God. And just like that, Jesus shows up in Nazareth and was baptized by John, just like all the others, even though he did not need to repent or to be ritually cleansed. And when Jesus came up out of the water, immediately he saw the sky being split open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, my beloved one. I am very pleased with you. So God witnesses to the reality of a relationship with Jesus here at his baptism by using words from a thousand years before when God inspired Isaiah the prophet. Again, verse 1, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. See, Isaiah understands something about the coming Messiah before Jesus is ever in the public eye. God promises to hold fast and to give divine aid to the Messiah for whom God has the deepest affection. The bond is so tight that God talks about the soul delighting in him. Now, this is the first time I had ever noticed this sort of what we call human-like or anthropomorphic designation. And then wouldn't you know it, it showed up in a psalm that I was reading this week. But that's for another day, and it's another sermon. We've got to focus. <laughs> so moving on in Isaiah. The servant has a ministry, which is a prediction of what Jesus will be all about. Verse 1 he will bring forth justice to the nation. Verse 3, he will faithfully bring forth justice. Verse 4, till he's established justice in the earth. So I spent the week thinking about the combination of justice and gentleness or mercy. Now, I was so attuned to injustice that I caught myself overly identifying with a fictional character. I have a favorite author, Stephen Lawhead, and he writes a book about the legendary Robin Hood. And because it's fiction, he can do with the story as he wishes. And he puts Robin Hood at the time of the Norman invasion in Britain in the 11th century. And he makes Robin Hood a Welshman leading this ragtag group against those new conquerors. So this fictional situation <clears throat> was a group of knights riding through the forest looking for wild animals to kill. The dense forest was yielding nothing, and so they had started to turn back when a local Welsh herdsman was taking his six head of cattle through a portion of the, the forest. Well, the bored knights decided that the killing of this man's animal would make for good sport and for good food. So they proceeded to kill every last animal while the commander watches on, complicit in their actions. The man who had just lost his whole livelihood tried to plead for justice for some recourse, but the powerful commander didn't care one bit 
for this poor man's situation. I found myself so angry as I read this portion of this fictional portion. <laughs> but why? What, what was it about it? <laughs> See, the Welsh are, were the bruised reeds. They were the faintly burning wicks in need of justice. And also, I know that the world does not turn on justice and that these kinds of injustices, they happen all the time. Now, this event may not have happened or did not happen, but people have lived through worse day in and day out. So I found myself praying, Lord, establish your justice just like you said you would in Isaiah 42. See, justice means right order. And the opposite of right order is chaos. Hmm. I think we saw evidence of that this week. You may already know that the word justice and righteousness are so often paired together. You see, the Messiah's mission is to restore God's right order in the world. The point is made three times in the short section of Scripture. So while the cross of Christ is definitely about forgiveness of people who have gone astray by our sinfulness, it is also about dealing with with all the effects of sin in the world and restoring God's goodness on all levels. And the way Jesus brings, Jesus brings God's right order into the world is not from a position of strength, but really more, it looks like weakness. I'm referring, of course, to the cross. God does not break an already bent and bruised reed, nor does God snuff out a weakly flickering candle. God disarms those who are trapped by others in dungeons, in the darkness of their prisons, not with overpowering brute force, but with gentleness, with grace. These spiritual forces need to be vanquished. The, Isaiah, the Messiah's mission is stated also in verse 7. So this is Isaiah 42, 7. To open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. See, there is mercy for the broken, the powerless, the forgotten, the weak, and we, we have a mission too. And our mission is that we minister in the same way. And that way is not easy. Those of us with power or influence find it also, it might be even counterintuitive to give up power or to give up influence and to follow with a gentle touch. But the servant of God will not cry out or lift up her voice or make it heard in the street, even though Jesus was very much a prophet. And the servants will not scream or yell, crying out for all to hear, although right words, true words, are foundational to right order. There is no screaming because we know that there is brokenness among whom we work. Broken and shattered spirits are the kind of legacy of the realm of Satan. Faintly burning wicks that are now quenched is the way of the competitive dog-eat-dog -dog world and not the way of justice. Now, the good news is that, is that Jesus will not grow faint or be discouraged until he's established justice in the earth. What is bruised and bent, he will not break. 
He will not blow out that smoldering candle. Rather, he will faithfully turn his attention to doing justice. And although Jesus faces obstacles, resistance, and great pressure, he will not crack. And he will not give up on things until things are set right. Now, I think it's important to listen to voices of people of color, pastors and thinkers who can challenge my own perspective, perhaps pointing out blind spots for me. So I follow up a person named Esau Macaulay, who is a black Anglican priest who came to speak at our diocesan uh, synod last year, so a little bit more than a year ago. He's an author and a New Testament professor at Wheaton College. And I read this article in Religion News Service. The title is Truth Over Power. So what if the ongoing protests that we see is not so much about a search for truth as it is an attempt to shape truth to suit the desires of the powerful. The Gospel of John records a scene in the last days of Jesus' life. In it, Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea, asks if the claims about Jesus being king are accurate and, by implication, seditious. Is Jesus a friend of Rome or its enemy? And then Jesus responds with this enigmatic statement. He says that he comes to bear witness to the truth. And of course, we know Pilate says, what is truth? <laughs> In other words, Jesus thought that there was a bigger question than being on the side of Rome or against it. There was the question of being on the side of truth. Jesus, unlike Pilate, is all about justice and righteousness. But the scene between Jesus, Pilate and Jesus embodies the church's claims over and against the state ever since. See, power and truth can be separated. Those with money, popularity, and resources do not determine reality, although they may try. And it weakens our witness, witnesses at witness as Christians by aligning truth with power. It's a classic error that has always led to ruin. Whenever truth bends to power, the poor and the marginalized inevitably suffer. The fictitious herdsman suffers just like the bruised reed and the faintly burning candle. Even as the one beaten and bloody, Jesus reveals what humanity was designed to be. But the way of Jesus is not through bullying and strong-arm tactics. Strength and transformation do not come through the assertion of the will. Strength is the willingness to suffer and be counted as weak, to be on the side of truth and love and justice. See, Jesus is every bit as strong even when he appeared weak. For the Christian, we disregard right order when we toss away our integrity to hold on to power. Equally, right order is lost when we cower in silence. For Jesus' people, as his servants, we are most human when we live completely in accord with the truth and in accord with right order. For the Christian, it's not a theory about how one might live. The resurrection proves transform transformative power can come out of weakness. God can snatch victory out of a certain defeat. The resurrection, the triumph of the humiliated and seemingly powerless one frees us 
to tell the pilots of the world what is true. I was so grateful to have such a rich passage to meditate on this week. May you know this day the greater depths of Isaiah 42, verse 3. A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. Pray with me. Lord, enthrone Jesus as king in our hearts and establish our allegiance to you, Lord God. Through Jesus, amen.